bit of a recap in terms of where we are. We're in the last of the webinar series. We've gone through, I guess, six steps so far. And just know that at any time you can go back to this hub on Teachable and at the um, beginning of each of these, I've inserted the um, video. So if you happen to miss it, you can go back to step one and it'll have the webinar for both of those steps. And in webinar two, under step three, I've put the video and I'll do the same for this one in case you've got colleagues who've missed um, elements and want to go back and recap. And also within each of those, I've put various um, tools that will help you work through those steps. So in webinar three, we're really interested in helping you um, help customers find you. We're going to go through some of the ideas around that. Um, also the segmentation and how we've used this to build lists and really informative lists for um, driving email marketing and other um, advertising campaigns by having this segmentation approach. In step nine, we're going to um, move over to Harriet and Lou, who are going to show you how we've built trust and connection with some of our case studies. And then in step 10, I'll summarise some of the research and how we prioritise going forward. So hopefully that makes sense for the agenda. Um, just in terms of uh, this step, you know, we want to still attract the right audience and how do we make sure your audience is finding you? Um, just in terms of this poll, I know half of you have done it now. This is a good starting point. You know, having a Google um, business listing is one of those key things that can help people find you. Um, Google being the centre of search, you want to make sure that you've claimed your Google business listing. So some of you have, which is great. If you haven't, or you're not sure what it is, um, just go into Google and put in Google My Business and it'll bring up um, where you can claim your business listing. So that is your address, but also where people can leave Google reviews. So that's one of the, the key things that you can do in terms of being found. And within that um, claiming of your business, you can put things like your category that your business belongs in. You can also do things like even post your blogs to um, that listing. It just gives you another space or hub that Google owns where you can um, be more targeted about your business. So you definitely want to do that. Um, in terms of whether you've got a style guide for your company and some people might not know what that is and Luke will go into that. It's great to see that, you know, three of you have filled it out, do have that um, and one of you don't and I guess a couple of you haven't filled it out. But that's really about having um, your logo and your colours and having consistency in what you do online and that's really important in terms of your branding. So I'll end the poll for now and... I'll just leave that off to the side and actually I might just turn that off for now and we'll keep, we'll keep going. So I guess in terms of being found, as we sort of did in the first session, it's really making sure you understand who your customer is. And that, look, it seems like an easy call, but it really isn't. Um, a lot of businesses I go into still haven't identified that ideal customer and it just makes everything harder so you know if you're going to be found by doing advertising if you're going to be found by social email everything revolves back around this individual the problems that they have what they're putting into search um, how they're you know what their challenges are all your copy everything is around that particular buyer and Often small businesses and mini businesses say to me, well, Dan, I've got three or four buyers. That's okay. You can do this for each of those. But I think really doing it for your ideal one is the place to start and then build off from there. So it might be that, you know, the starting point for you is, you know, guessing about your buyer, but you really don't have to. I think 
um, you know, even, you know, doing some research based on your existing customer at the moment, customers and doing a survey and asking them some of these questions, whether it's using, you know, SurveyMonkey or, um, you know, Typeform, Formstack, even Google Forms and trying to ask some questions. It's a really good time to do this now because, you know, with the COVID, if they've got some issues as we've just been talking about inventory or safety or health now's the time to ask those questions so that you can tweak your content to make it more relevant but particularly identifying those that might be less likely to buy now might be holding off things it can help make your decisions in business when we have so many things uncertain more certain um, so i encourage you to do that but if you're going to do it only do it once, don't annoy your customers. And maybe there needs to be something in it for them. Um, so I'll show you some examples of that. In terms of customer lists, you know, having a sign up form, having your contact form, there's um, forms that you can have in LinkedIn ads, you know, even with a purchase. Um, so you can have forms not just for surveying, but I think when you do do a form, it's a good opportunity for you to ask that extra um, piece of information. I've been saying to the clients, well, please put your mobile on the form. And that's because SMS is becoming so much more popular. So I know there's a little bit of friction sometimes when you've got a download form, you don't want to ask for too much. But I don't think a lot of people really mind putting in the mobile and you can always put it in this optional um, just so you're capturing that extra bit of information. But in terms of doing surveys, and we'll have a bit of a look, I think, um, you know, type form, um, you know, having forms built in MailChimp, some of you might use that, um, form stack or Google or other way to go. Um, and that will just help you be um, more predictable in terms of being able to answer some of these questions, like why did you buy for us? from us in the first place. Um, what's one thing that we did that you really love? This will help you create that really attractive content. And it'll also just test those assumptions about what you think is really valuable for your customers. Because remember when we did the value proposition section last time, we've made some assumptions about why people buy from us. I think it's really important to test that. Um, as I, I think I mentioned this in the first webinar, you know, I had make better marketing decisions in my tag, but when I actually tested that assumption, it was much more around business decisions. So I changed that in my logo. So asking those questions can really help you and it can even help what did you type into Google? You know, if you're doing AdWords, why not ask that question? And again, at the end of this financial year might be a time to do it. Um, and you can always, you know, if you're a B2B business, maybe it's about giving them a, um, you know, 30 minute audit or a catch up or, a, um, you know, some sort of service offering. And if you're a product based business, maybe it's about doing a competition, but getting those insights to make sure that you've got and you're talking to the right customer is really key. So what have we done once we've got that information? So here's two examples. This one's from Pitt and Cherry. What we did on the contact us form is made sure that we asked which sector they were in. Um, I think that's really important because then after we asked that information, we could then segment more carefully those prospects and send them relevant things, whether it was a case study that was relating to the transport sector or the mining sector or put, in, put them straight in contact with that lead um, expert. So, you know, if they put mining, we might send that straight to Dano Tool, whereas if they put tourism, we might send that to somebody else. So having something in your form collection that makes it more intelligent, I think is, is worthwhile. Similarly, in the um, consumer version, we asked, um, we've done a number of surveys, which I've sort of shown you on our homepage, but this one was about trying to work out what were your personal 
skin concerns so that we could then deliver that to you. And so, you know, for each of your businesses, there would be questions that you could ask that would make sure that you can deliver greater value. And I'm just encouraging you to do that as people are really looking for that one-to-one -one experience. Um, how are you providing that? And, and guessing's no longer an option. You really need to know. So setting that up, whether it's in your form collection or by doing a survey, I think that's the way to go. So when we did this particular one, I'll give you an example, we could then find out that of these thousand people we surveyed, who had issues with what? So we knew not only that 600 had this issue, so what are the top issues? We could actually go back just to those 600 with an offer for those particular issues and you know, lining up our product and or service offering with that. Similarly for dark circles, sensitive skin, so you get the picture. We could also do it by age group. So for example, and, and both of these things in combination. So for example, we knew that over 50s um, were a certain percentage of this group and we could map that to, say for example, if it was fine lines, we could use both of those as um, fields, if you like, in our communication back. So hopefully you can see how powerful that can be, not just in an email campaign, but also we could retarget these people in um, Facebook, Instagram, and or LinkedIn now that offers targeting. So um, getting that information down to that level is the key. Once you've done that, then there's lots of things you can do with it. If you haven't asked it, then you can't use it in your ads. You can't use it on your website. For example, on our website, we can do a pop-up just to these people that are in the 30 age group and, and present certain offerings to them. Similarly, we can do it with people with redness, but just the people that come onto our site. Um, but if we don't have it, we can't do it. Any questions around that? I haven't got any questions, but if you've got questions, just put your hand up and I'll see it. And um, no questions at the moment, so we'll, we'll keep going. Um, uh, Dan, it's yeah. Dan. How does what you've got here relate to segmentation so clearly you've got some segments based on their individual needs but then you must have more, a more detailed segmentation somewhere as well yes so what happens is um i can probably show you that now just let, me, let me just um I'll just close out of that um i'll just escape out of this for a second so that can ask me all the curly questions. I'm just wellness, um, inner beauty uh, powders, the collagen powder for them. So, but the next email after that, three days later, would talk about something else. And so, sort of what you said, Ken, it can be on any variable. And that's the thing. There's just so many variables that we can do. Age, health, you know, whether they smoke or not, whether they put sunscreen or not, whether they're pregnant or not, it's just infinite. And so I guess the starting point is always collecting the information, the flows and the segmentation then provide all that opportunity. And what we're finding is the more targeted we can be, the better response that we're getting. And so that's the aim of it. And we're only in the infancy of setting these up and testing them and testing it, everything that we do. So it's a, it's a, it's a long road, if you like. Um, but, you know, the, the benefit is that, you know, we then have that database and we always encourage people to do those surveys so that we can serve them up more tailored content. So just moving on from that, I just wanted to break into um, this process before I hand over um, to Luke and Harriet to go through, well, what do you do once you've got that information in a format? So you've done a survey or you've updated your um, contact us form or you're thinking about creating a piece of content to then segment your database, what do you do? So this is the process that we normally go through with a client 
I normally spend some time three to four weeks having a number of meetings, doing some auditing on what you've actually got right now and do you know what makes you different. Um, I do a bit of a SWOT um, and this involves surveying your customers and your employees because they're part of your brand, your competitors, we do a whole SWOT and we actually profile out that ideal customer once we've done that research. So we sort of do this bit. And then once we've done all of that, we do a meeting where we reveal all those findings, if you like. And that culminates in this brand strategy workshop. And that's about aligning everything that we've done through this research and through the S&P, which is a strategic marketing plan, into what are we going to do next? How are we going to create the people that we're talking to? How do we make that in more detail and make it come to life um, so that we can then create this application, which generally turns out to be some form of copywriting um, and then what collateral we need in terms of is it a website, is that a download, um, what is that? So we, we have a copywriting team brought into that process and that's often Harriet. Um, and then the design of everything that sort of happens in here, especially if you don't have a style guide, but flows through into this process, which is um, Luke's um, area. And he can talk through that in terms of what that looks like. So what I wanted to do is hand over to the team to take you through those specialist areas. Um, having gone through most of this in the last two webinars and some of this, I think it's important to go through the rest of this so you can see how marketing plays out um, across that. So what I might do is um, I'll first hand over to Harriet, who's gonna take you through, you know, the journalist and the um, freelance of creating copy in that process. And then we'll hand over to Luke. Oh, sorry, Luke, I should've got a better picture of you there. Um, but we've got you in the flesh, so that's, <laughs> that's good. Um, so Harriet, can I hand over to you? And Thanks, Dan. That's okay. Uh, Dan, I might let you keep sharing the screen yeah. and you can flick through the slides as we go, if you like. Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you. So I'm a Melbourne-based um, sport and health copywriter and journalist. I've been working with Dan for about five years, I think it is, Dan. Um, I started out in newspapers and um, over the last six years or so, I've really moved into the, the SEO and the digital copywriting and content marketing, particularly in the health and sport um, industries. And certainly as Dan's touched on, one thing we've really noticed this year um, as a result of the pandemic is that your, your copy really needs to be dynamic. Um, it's not just about selling your product or service, it's about all the value add. So making sure that your copy is memorable, educational, entertaining, relatable, endearing, which is really, really important and empathetic. Um, and as Dan's mentioned, as we know, more people are online. Um, you know, I get my screen alert every Saturday morning and the hours are just, the minutes and the hours are clocking up. So th there's no doubt we're, on, we're online. Um, and that will be the same for your customers as well. So delivering um, consistent and valuable information is really important. And if people are not buying from you now or not as much as normal, they will reward you with the, the brand loyalty um, going, going forward. So uh, Dan, if you wanna just move to the next slide, thank you. Um, so I came into the edible beauty process, as Dan mentioned, um, when, when we were ready for, the, for some copywriting. So um, this really started for me with the strategic marketing plan that Dan mentioned, and really for me, researching and reading through that and getting a really good understanding of the um, extensive market research and the competitor analysis that Dan had done, the goals and objectives for the brand, the audience segments and the SWOT analysis. And then the customer survey, which was um, just gold from a copywriting point of view, because we could understand the type of problems that they the uh, customers have, but also the language that they use um, to, to explain their skin type 
and the products that they use and the concerns. So going forward, we could really make sure that the copy um, was relatable. So one thing also, apart from looking at the products that they used, it, we asked some questions around the lifestyle habits. And that was about um, it, uh, understanding, I guess, and looking at the wellness um, offering that this brand could, could build, um, which is something that we've really worked on through the copy and the brand and the design, which Luke will um, touch on as well. So it wasn't just about the products, but it, um, it's also about the wellness and the whole, the whole health, the holistic health, um, which we, we worked into the, the USP. So um, Dan, if we go to the next slide, the next step for me was uh, the brand workshop, um, which was held via Zoom uh, due to the travel restrictions. And that was with Danielle, uh, Luke, the founder and myself. Um, and in this, we really wanted to hear from Anna, the, the founder, her story and her why um, of why she started the business and why she wants to take it in the direction that she is now. Um, and so we really delved into, you know, who we want to reach with the content, what we want them to do as a result of finding and consuming the content, why should the audience care? And that's really about the points of difference. Um, and how will we get them coming back? So it wasn't just, we don't want them to just buy one product and see you later. It's about the value add and the, the ongoing personalized journey. Um, so from there, I wrote a um, who, what, why uh, marketing blueprint, if you like, which really um, fine tuned the unique selling proposition, um, which is you know, the point of difference for this brand, the brand messages, uh, the style guide, the mission, the core values, essential requirements, um, and, and the like. So once we had that document, we could share it with, with everybody involved. So from the staff, obviously the founder, the graphic design, the, the team that managed the social media, the PR, um, media organisation. So everybody was talking the same, the same language. Um, and then we moved into the, the next step, which was launching three products into this market of, um, during the, the pandemic, which for this brand was fantastic because one was a hand sanitizer, which, which brand uh, Dan mentioned, and the other two products were really focused on the wellness and immune system boosting and, and, and looking after yourself. So um, because we'd done all the market research and we had such a good understanding now of the pain points and what makes this brand different, we could really apply that copywriting technique, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is the problem, agitate and the solution. So um, we start off with the, the problem, understanding the problem that your audience faces, um, and that's critical in evoking a response uh, from the get-go with, with the copy, um, and then agitating it, which is, to be brutal, rubbing a little bit of salt into the wound um, and making it emotional and then delivering the solution, which is your product or service. So this was an example here, um, which Luke's done the fantastic design for. It was the um, Beauty Detox Shop Blend. So um, this copy, we, we built out a media release for the launch, uh, the email marketing, the web copy, uh, the social media copy and you'll see there we start off with the sluggish liver what that means so that's the problem the you know the uh, slow to to clearing hormones then we rub a little bit of salt in you know this results in clogged pores and, and breakout prone skin which can leave you also feeling tired and bloated and then delivering the solution which is the advanced formula and the focus on the ingredients the natural ingredients um, so Dan, if we just go to the next slide, thank you. The next step uh, was the website revamp, which we've been working on. Um, and that was the, the site architecture, which Luke might touch on too, was really about um, continuing the work that Dan had done in personalizing the customer's journey. And remembering that the longer they stay on your website, the better it is for SEO, but also the further down the sales funnel they'll go. So um, we started off by building out the, uh, the copy for the homepage and that 
again, we could draw on the who, what, why, which the, all the work we'd already done. So uh, here we, we started, we have some key elements like the USP, which you can see the example there, which is really refined and really bringing out um, the, the founder's story and her expertise, but also the, the point of difference, um, the wild crafted botanicals and luxurious ingredients. Um, and also, you know, the, it's not just about the, the, what you put on your skin, but also the, the beauty from within and looking after yourself um, internally. So uh, the, the key, the landing page also um, ha focuses on the key features and benefits. We've included testimonials, which add, um, add weight and also um, the, the trust icons of where the brand has been seen, what, what media um, publications they've appeared in, which is also adding weight. Um, and we applied SEO then to the build of the internal pages. And uh, what we're really trying to do here is uh, select a keyword phrase for each web page. So if you've got a 25 page website, uh, you would have 25 different keyword phrases that your audience would type into Google to try and find a product or service like yours. And then that keyword phrase this is sort of getting into the nitty gritty, a little bit of SEO copywriting, but it needs to appear not just in the copy, but in some places in the back end of the website. So in the, in the build itself. So we've got here the, the URL, the keyword phrase needs to be in the title tag and the metadata, which is the snippet uh, that you see on Google, um, the file name, the alt image alt tag, uh, the headline, we have a variation in the sub headline and then in the first hundred words of the copy. So um, the, the web copy now for Edible Beauty really focuses on uh, being SEO savvy, it's relatable. Um, we use very short sentences, less than 25 words. So it's really digestible um, and, and direct language, active verbs. So it's very engaging. It's really talking directly to the audience. Um, we gave a lot of consideration on every web page to the call to action and that's about uh, the customer journey as well and it's not always about directing them to a product. Sorry. Sorry, I think you've uh, muted yourself. Yeah, I'll, I'll unmute. Are you there? Um, sorry. Did I mute myself? Sorry. So I was trying to mute because I could hear some background noise. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Dan. Uh, so yeah, so the call to action was really important. Um, and we use Google Docs to build the, the web copy. Um, where everybody could could see the copy as it, as it was being developed and and make comments and made that review process um, a, a, re, a collaboration if you like um, and then the the final piece of the work for me from a copy point of view uh, Dan if you want to just jump to the final slide there it's really about going forward now um, with the the type of copy um, and it's again not just about selling but about adding value, being um, educating your audience, building your storytelling and brand awareness and remembering that 80-20 rule. So 80% of your, your copy should be conversational and 20% is the conversion. So with Edible Beauty, we, um, we've developed six key content pillars and every piece of content on all of their platforms sits under these six uh, content pillars. So, and that's about um, diversity and also bringing in uh, the the audience segments and talking talking to them so that that you know we're not just offering a product we're offering um, the f the full service of helping them live their best life really um, and then I've just included here for you some uh, content inspiration uh, which feeds into that eighty percent of conversational sort of value add copy so there's the instructional pieces education and value add pieces like the videos and podcasts, FAQs, giveaways, throwbacks, uh, the profile and review types of copy uh, that you can do and the personal copy, which is uh, really about humanizing the brand, which we know is really important. 
Um, uh, so that might be your founder story, the business story, your why and behind the scenes copy, which is um, really trending really well uh, at, at the moment. So uh, that's it for me, Dan. Thank you so much. And um, I'll pass over to, to Luke for his presentation yep. as well. Thank you. Thanks, Harriet. That's awesome. And look, guys, I think don't underestimate the, um, the value that Harriet's just provided you with in terms of some, you know, being found. This doesn't just apply to the website or blog. This, is, this applies to everything. It applies to all your social and what you put on your social, especially the SEO stuff. Um, the content pillars, you know, if you go to, um, you know, social media examiner or the content, um, I'm trying to think what it's called, the content, uh, oh, it's left my brain, but, you know, the best platforms that are recommending how to do content really well, this is it. So content pillars are really important how the copy is created. It just makes such a difference. And if you're going to divide up all your marketing spend in terms of what attracts customers, if you don't get this right, you may as well just be throwing your money away. So it's really important to get the right advice and real, you know, focus on doing this well. Um, and I always like to see a blend you know, some of your copy or some of your marketing should be in attracting the audience in terms of ad spend. Some of it should be organic, which is this stuff. You know, you, this is the stuff that's going to last. It's like your library. You know, it's never going to go away, whereas an ad is there today and gone tomorrow. So if you invest in it and do it really well, it will continue to work for you. I have one piece around construction marketing that still brings me leads today and I did it three years ago. So don't underestimate the technical expertise um, and savviness that this brings. It is really a big part of attracting your customers. Um, it doesn't matter what your business is. is. And so, um, Thanks, Harriet. I think that's been really, you packed it in. <laughs> and if anyone's got any questions, you know, we can take them at the end um, for any of us. So right now I'll hand over to Luke. And Every project's different. Um, whatever that result is, is, is the best for them. And whether that's to, um, in Edible Beauty's case, um, Edible Beauty um, is, you know, if they wanted... You know, though I guess from as soon as I saw them, I thought, well, the foundation of what they've got is is pretty good. Um, from a design point of view, it lacked consistency, and um, that's that's where it was bringing itself down. There was, you know, it was added on, you know, tacked on over time, bit by bit by bit. Um, you know, packaging was slightly different, inconsistent uses of um, of of topography and imagery. Um, so everything sort of looked different. There was no cohesiveness in that. There was no um, no way of sort of saying, well, apart, aside from the logo itself that was positioned on there, and sometimes even the logo was was um, positioned different on each, on each product. And also the, the logo had been edited or tweaked over time. So there was various different forms of, of the logo. Um, so we, we defined in, in our workshops that moving forward, it was key to, to um, bring in consistency um, and, and make sure that, you know, moving forward, that that was always a due to. So as it's, it's, it's impossible to kind of tick off everything all at once. There's, there's a large range of products there's various forms of marketing and, and things that are, are, um, that are that need to be done. But over time, as as Anna needs something reprinted or relabeled on a package, where we're, we're refining that with a, a larger goal in mind of, of creating consistency, making the brand more luxurious. So whether that's you know selections of you know, paper or 
Um, yesterday we, we undertook a product photo shoot, so the products, the way that they're shot is much more luxurious and appealing. So little things like that as we go through and, and develop and change the brand. Um, it's not a big jarring, um, you know, big, big jump to, to change. In the eye of the, the client, it's a slow progression that they may not even notice, but things will start to, to look much more appealing and, and in line with where Anna um, sees, sees that. So it's not, um, yeah, it's important to say that it's not myself or anyone else coming in and saying, Anna, you need to do this. It's everybody's on, yeah, yeah, on, the, same, um, on the same journey. And we're, we're in a way helping Anna meet her her goals and her vision um, and we're showing her from our experience how to do that um, I would never go into a into a, a new project or um, or meet someone and say you're doing it wrong we need to do it this way it's, it's going back to what I originally first said it's it's these are educated responses um, and we're helping them get to an outcome and we're using different variations or forms of research that um, that help us get there as well as obviously our expertise. Um, the value that we're bringing on, on this slide where it, it's, it does come in many 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 forms. Um, I've sort of touched on a few um, but with with any project from Design by Bird we're, we're also doing we're, we're doing the same thing we're ticking off these certain boxes where um, being authentic, so authenticity of the brand vision. Um, we're visually taking um, the the vision of the client or the founder of the business research, and we're trying to articulate that into a, a, a unique response. We're not designing based on trend or anything. It, it is unique to that client, and again, that's informed by by research. Um, Project immersion. Um, that 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 happens, you know, or well, can only happen once we've built trust. I touched on that before. We need to build trust in order to get the best outcome. Immerse ourselves into the into the process, um, like it is our own our own business. Um, and that's the response from that is that the, you know the client embraces and sees that we're doing that and. Um, and it's not—it's not fake. It's—it should be something that's just that's natural, and it's you know because I'm passionate, and I want people to to get results, and I want to see them. Um, you know, uh, for me, it's like a drug. If I can find, um, if I can create a response um, that gets a huge result in the broader, um, you know, public sales that increase the adrenaline. For me, it's like you know, it's great. Um, and I want that, so I want to get that every time. And I want the client to succeed, and I want to. It. So it's 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 important that we we um, we do that. Um, so yeah, all outcomes should be purposeful, bespoke, and memorable. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, oh, sorry, Dan, just one one sec. Our, our client, if you can go back to the last one, our client journey. Um, it starts with build, building trust. The second step is explore and innovate. We can't explore and innovate and create something. We can't deliver the idea unless we build that trust. So it all goes back to, to that first step. We can't exceed expectations if we haven't got them. So we have to make sure we do everything. It's, it's really important. Um, but it, yeah, it basically comes back to Dan's initial effort to dig deep and share that information with us. And then when we meet the client, we've got a good understanding of, of what they've been doing. Um, then we ask, him, though, ask the correct questions and move forward in, in, the, in a positive direction from that first initial, whether it's conversation by phone or face-to-face. -face. Um, so that they're the four steps, build trust, explore and innovate, deliver the idea and exceed expectations. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, thanks, Tim. The edible beauty for, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit sort of deeper into the brand now. As I said before, edible beauty had a, a, a fairly good foundation of, of what was there. It just wasn't consistent. There was no sort of, it had, it had it changed 
depending on the product, depending on the advert, depending on the web page, it was there was no nothing. So it's important that there is consistency in the eye of the the, the buyer or the user. Um, consistency creates um, credibility, um, and it shows that you know it's a, it's a very simple thing. It's not hard hard to achieve, um, but it, it it certainly does add to um, add to not, not only just the aesthetic of what things look like, so yeah, well, that, the package looks beautiful, but yeah, it adds to credibility because it shows that you're a bit more serious. So th this is just a little thing, but it's actually a really big thing. But on the left-hand side there, which is the logo, which is what they've been using, one of the first things we did was just to, to tidy that up and give it, give it some basic um, rules about spacing um, and, and we tighten it up. So visually, um, it, it may look similar, but it's actually more um, more equally spaced, easier to read um, at, at smaller sizes on packaging or larger um, and on screen or in print. Um, but it's just got, so we've increased the, the word Australia and given it optically, um, optical space around, so it just breathes better and, and looks better. Um, we, we haven't gone into, a, or at this point in time, a full style guide for Edible Beauty Australia. Um, uh, because I guess time hasn't really allowed it. And at, the, at this point in time, I'm um, designed by birds, the only sort of designer that's sort of working on these. So it's, it's quite, um, I'm able to control things, but um, moving forward, these, this would be a, a very basic snapshot of what could be included in a style guide. And some of you are probably familiar with that, but just the basic rules on, on how a logo should be used or um, you know how it's positioned on something. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Tim. Uh, side by side, so the left left two products are um, previous or what's currently on the market, and the right right hand side too. So they're both native collagen powder and the gut replenish powder. Um, small tweaks to again, create consistency. So moving forward with a larger um, larger vision on how things will start to look. Um, you can see that the, the previous two, there was no primary core brand color used. They were both very different and the, the way that they positioned the topography on the, on the package well, both packages are, are different, even though they're, they're, they're from the same company and they're in the same wellness range. So um, what we've, we've done is to, you can see the, the new use of the logo there, so it's more legible. You can see Australia more easily and it, and it breathes, it's got equal spacing. Um, and the use of typography is optically scaled depending on the, the product. Um, and it's just, it, it appears to be from the same range. It doesn't feel too disjointed. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please, Tim. This is another example of, of that. Um, so the existing package on the left, there was, there's no consistency. Um, Topography's been sort of thrown out the window in various forms. They actually, uh, which is one of the common things we're finding is, is there's lots of different um, fonts being used at, at time, sort of five or six different fonts. Um, and not consistent from the back or the front. So you know, we've we're tidied that right up, stripped it back to um, two different fonts, whether that be, uh, I'm using their weights as well, so from light, medium and bold, or, or um, italicized. Um, so just tightening the reins um, on everything, um, simplifying the use of color. You can see on these two on the right hand side, the um, use of the blue. So the primary color is in the foreground and the background is um, the sort of ink or washed washed element that wraps the, the boxes. So it's, it's things like that are used in a more dynamic way and, and not um, sort of a more less is, or a less is more approach. So celebrating negative and white space and using the graphics to kind of create something that's more appealing on the shelf. Um, but the, at the forefront of that is the brand itself, the brand name. So that needs to be, be clear. So that 
um, positioned at the top, you know, given its own real estate and space and, and not crowded by um, too much floral or too much other um, colour. Um, so, yeah, moving forward, it's, it's the, those um, design principles are very much at the fore. Um, I was talking to Anna again yesterday and it's, it's not about not using the old patterns or the florals. There's, there is some, something beautiful about many of those and how they've been used, but it's, it's just making a decision, a decision on how they should be used um, and that might just be in a more refined way, similar to the, the ones that are shown on the, the right here. Can we go to the next one, Dan? Um, I think this is the last example of, of a package um, and, and its progression. So the mask itself, going back, consistent use of topography and the box that contains the, um, the set of masks itself, how that can use. So there's a consistency on the front of the, the type on the front. So it is, it's the same range, it's the same product. It's just, this is just a box that contains them. So there shouldn't be too much variation there, but we're, we're celebrating another uh, element of the brand, which is, um, you know, the, the green natural color. It's just dustier green. And we've paired that with um, impressions of botanicals. So we've used ink and we've pressed um, shapes and things into it. So we've we're sort of paired it back and made it, um, as I said before, less is more. Um, this is, yeah, and it's, it's too be refined further um, and perhaps even more simple. Um, so there's something I love about just the that celebration of the colour and the type rather than too much graphic in this. Um, that's it's another example. Um, I think the last slide is, uh, oh, that's similar. The sachets, the, the new refined sachets, you can see going back to the, the mask previously and the boxes, you can see how things are starting to, to come together. There's more of a, a broader vision and, and, and they're all tying together now. Um, if you can go to the next one, please, Tim. Um, yeah, and the web digital space. So this is um, really, I guess, a f the foundation and celebration of the work that um, Harriet's done with topography and Dan with the, the structure and, you know, placement of the, the site. But this is just a snapshot of a, the web new website that's been built now um, from versus the existing one that's on the, the left-hand side. Um, product. Yeah, product photography is is underway to to you know celebrate that more luxurious feel, um, um, but the new site is yeah, structured in a way that's easier for for clients um, or the the user to interact and, and find the product, but visually more appealing and luxurious in the way that things are styled um, and not so much um, what I would say is you know the perhaps a little tackiness of using, um, you know, the, the cucumbers or the turmeric and things like that, but it's more, how, how can we style it differently to make it more appealing? Um, and the, the new um, photography does that in a way we're using um, lighting and shadows and textural elements to kind of celebrate the natural um, and the, the, or the ingredients that go into it, but we're, we're lighting and also you know using shadows and reflection to um you know show the product off as best we can essentially uh, as in print and in web we've simplified the use of the, the fonts that are used so it's it's in terms of hierarchy it's easier to to um to see um on the screen and and read um so it's not just about navigation but it's how it's how you how legibility on the screen is also just as important. Um, and yeah, and importantly, how people can, can make a purchase. Is it easy for people to find a product, add it to their cart um, and go on that journey so they're not trying to you know, fumble around and, um, and make payments or not being able to, to find things. Um, I think that's it, Dan, is there one more slide there? Uh, I think that's it. 
the last one that I had. Um, but thanks for that, Luke. I think that, you know, hopefully everyone can see that having a um, design eye on everything that you do is a big part of your brand. And just the start from, you know, that really, you know, even this slide here, you know, showing the difference between this product and where it is. And, you know, the website's due any tick of the clock, you know, just the journey, like on the site at the moment, you know, you had to, this is even an improvement, isn't it, Luke? But mm. we had to scroll and just the experience for the customer was just so much worse. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's, Anna's really thrilled with it. I don't think she could even envisage what it could be. Um, but now that we're nearly there, it's um, a massive boost. And I think what we all said is it now reflects the quality of the product. There was a disconnect between what she was selling and how she was presenting it. And now it's sort of aligning. So it's a really exciting time. For all yeah, of us. Well, her, her products themselves have, have that reputation already. Yes. Uh, they're, they're, they're unique in Australia in terms of their, their uh, I think, Australia's first range of edible beauty products. And it's probably one of the world's first, not just Australia's first. Yeah. But it doesn't, and, and the ingredients go in there are, are, are natural botanicals, you know, uh, premium products. Um, and going to the existing side or looking at previous marketing tools, the um, assets, the, 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 it didn't show that. So there, there needs to be a, a premium point or more of a um, aspirational sort of quantity about it, quality about it um, that wasn't there before. Because the, in, in many of the products, the price point kind of says that, but looking at it or seeing it on the shelf didn't, didn't sit in the right sort of area. No. So, so where we're going to now, I think is, um, is where it should be going, um, and but you know, that that that's informed by um, our discussions with Anna, where she wants it to be, and your research of you know, how we get there. Not just you know my my ability is to come in and well, this is this is where we go because this will look good and this is where it needs to fit. But yeah, we can't get there unless other boxes are ticked. Thanks, Luke. And hopefully just by going through that exercise, um, everyone can sort of see how it all pulls together. Um, just in conclusion, I just wanted to summarise, I guess, what we've tried to do over the last three webinars, and then I'll just direct you to some other tools. So what do we do to keep ahead of this next stage of the COVID crisis. I, I think anyone who's watching the news knows that it's it's here for the longer term. And, you know, at least in the next 12, 18 months, we're going to have this disruption to our business. So what can you do? I think just having an audit of your position and being really realistic about what your business um, can and can't do um, looking at those particular market drivers, and I did that in the last session, um, and the trigger points for your customers or clientele, looking at different scenarios and planning out for those in terms of the geographical markets, your product categories, your channels, and you do that with customer insight so that you can plan as much as you can in this landscape for for the best outcome for your business. Um, so like reviewing what you can do based on the segments and even based on new behaviours, I really encourage you and I've put in um, this particular uh, webinar some more research from Mackenzie about what that means, particularly for B2B and, and you know, how we need to massage what we're doing in terms of that outlook and customer base and what's actually going to pique their curiosity given what they're going through. So, but really reviewing that in a realistic view, having a look at what your portfolio is. So I know a number of you are IT and health related. What's going to be most top of mind? Um, 
you know, integrity of information, um, backup systems in terms of IT and personal walkthroughs, training, um, you know, product portfolio, what's, you know, in terms of demand for that, what do you need to relook at? And sometimes that needs relooking at the value proposition stage and re rejigging it in light of where we're at at the moment. Um, in terms of marketing, you know, do you wait to bounce back or do you create a marketing plan with growth? And, you know, in the first webinar, I explained those that actually take on marketing more vigorously will have a better outcome. So, but it's what, what do you actually do with that? Um, so one thing that's really sure, and particularly through the research that I've done over the last 12 weeks is that there is a definite trend to accelerate this digital e-commerce world. And from a perspective of a small business owner, you really need to embrace that space. Um, so even if it isn't through spin, just knowledge of that space, I think is really important so that you can gear up if you haven't already for where your customers are, which is online. Um, a big part of that brand and, and what Luke and Harriet were referring to is this um, authenticity and leading with purpose. I think communicating frequently to your install base or customers is important that you don't have all the answers but at least you're communicating with them and that stamping yourself with that purpose of what you're all about um, has more bearing on your brand now than before and people are looking for that leadership so that's something that you can think about when you're creating your content going forward um, so they're just some of the things to sort of recap on um, as we sort of finalise this last webinar. I'd encourage you to go back to the Marketing Hub on Teachable and have a look at some of the resources I've put in there. I'll put this, um, this webinar in there as a slide deck and um, a video. Um, that you can contact any of us, whether you're starting at, you know, an audit position, whether you heard Luke and you need some help with your brand consistency, or if you're starting to create those pieces of content as lead magnets for your business, I'm sure that Harriet can help you out. Um, we're happy to do one-on-one -on -one with you and on the portable, um, teachable I've got a link which is this one here that I'll forward to you and you can make a time with any of all of us to have you know a half an hour consult after this to move your business forward. Um, I've really enjoyed this webinar series with you and you know thanks for your time and I'll just hand over to Ken in case he's got some final comments about um, the survey at the end of this. Ken, did you want to say anything? I think I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, I unmuted yeah, you. Just two things. I think one of the key things for me and in my experience in dealing with a lot of clients um, is that most businesses don't understand their value proposition as well as they should. The mm -hmm. problem is if you don't understand it well yourself and you can't communicate it effectively to clients, then it comes down to the thing that they understand and that's the dollar sign. So for premium products, it's absolutely essential that you can communicate your, your value proposition succinctly and effectively. So yeah, just, just make sure you can do that. That's absolutely critical. Um, the second thing is the survey. I'm gonna send out the survey link. Um, not many people have completed it in the past, so I would, encourage each of you to complete it. It's absolutely important for us to demonstrate value to our stakeholders that people are getting um, good insights from these programs and there's a lot of value. So, I mean, these cost us money to put on. So I would ask each of you to um, please, please respond to the survey. It'll only take you a minute or two. It's not, it's not a very long survey. So, but also if you could give us some insights of the benefits that you've gained from this process, 
that would be helpful as well. So thank you again for attending and uh, thanks Danielle for your the insights that you've provided. No problem. Thanks everyone. And on the portal, you'll see a free coach session. If you want to fill that in, you just um, can click on the button or go down, um, leave your information and we'll come back to you with a coaching session to help you out to take this further, um, if you like. All right. Well, thanks, Luke, and thanks, Harriet, for your time as well. And um, we'll chat in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.